Um, <laughs> what I want to talk about instead, I want to tell you, a, I, want to, I want to give you an analysis and a little bedtime story because it's Friday afternoon. And so the story is called Vampires, Zombies and Humans, A Guide to Surviving the Neoliberal Apocalypse. And the context of this is a context of higher education in South Africa at the moment. Okay. Now, we've all been watching Fees Must Fall, we've all been watching Roads Must Fall, we, we've been involved with transformation debates, actually not just this year and last year, but for the last 25 years at least. Um, and there's a lot of red herrings that are distracting people at the moment. And a lot of people are getting all fussed up and claiming that universities are under threat at the moment, which I believe they are. Um, and what they and, and, and there are two different kind of positions here. And the one is saying universities are, are, are under threat by these uh, reactionary elites, these old white men, various interest groups who don't want to see transformation, who want universities to continue to be self-serving, elitist, um, closed shops. Um, and there's another group of people, and these people seem to be making a lot of comments on uh, threads on the internet that think that the universities are under threat from hooligans. Uh, revolutionary protesters who are trying to shut them down. And I don't believe the university is under threat from either of those two things. I think there's a much more serious, much more sinister threat facing universities in South Africa. And um, my paper is really about the fact that I think that universities are under threat by precisely these vampires and zombies, these people who live off the lifeblood of others and people who eat the brains of humans. And so what I wanted to do is to explain to you what I mean by that. Okay, so we're grappling with transformation. And in the first instance by transformation, we usually mean a transformation of, of demographics, of student and staff demographics. We're trying to get more representative demographics. We've done it largely with our student population. Uh, bodies, we've largely failed to do it across South Africa with our staffing bodies. Um, we're also grappling with transformation around access. We, the, we're grappling especially with the issue of uh, financial exclusion, but also, uh, to go back to the theme of decolonization that I was talking about yesterday, we do, we're grappling with structural marginalization, the way in which the universities don't just exclude people by making them themselves unaffordable. They do it in these very subtle um, uh, institutional ways by, by making it, uh, by not providing the environment that actually supports and nurtures disadvantaged people and makes it possible for them to succeed. We're also in the middle of a big set of debates around Eurocentrism versus Afrocentrism linked to that debates around colonial languages versus multilingualism. Um, and at the level of teaching and learning, there are fundamental debates around traditions of core curriculum versus arguments for relevance and renewal. Okay. And th this all obviously has a, our own particular South African historical context, which, which is the fact of trying to overcome a, what, a previous um, tradition of apartheid education, both at a primary and secondary level and at university level. And that a lot of our thinking is really an, an anti-apartheid thinking still of trying to undo the, um, the damage done by, by the racially divisive and unequal educational system. Okay. And my argument today is, don't get stuck with that stuff. That's the obvious stuff. There's something going on behind the curtain um, that's actually a little bit more slippery than that. And that is another transformation that has been happening that has been much less debated and much less agreed to. And that, de that debate and, and that transformation has less of a South African context and more of a global context. And it's part of a 30-year global move from uh, um, ideas of kind of uh, socially responsible democracy towards political forms of neoliberalism. Um, and I'm not going to give you a big rundown on what we mean by neoliberalism. I mean, it's a jargon word that really gets thrown around a lot today. But one of the ways I want you to think about it is neoliberalism can, in one sense, be thought of running everything as though it was a business, taking the model 
of businesses and applying them to things that aren't businesses, applying them to things like social services, governments, community organizations, and even, interestingly enough, people starting to think about themselves as businesses, starting to think about themselves not as a human being, but as a career. Um, um, and, and, and I think this is a really deep and pervasive kind of structural shift that has happened in our lifetimes. And what I want to do is try and focus on that and, to, and, and, and bring that to the fore. So what does the neoliberalization of education mean? Well, first of all, it means shifting education from being a public good to a private advantage. That education is no longer something that the state funds in order to improve the entire society for everyone in it. Instead, uh, education becomes something that individuals invest in in order to get returns, in order to improve their own career pro pro prospects. Okay, um, And so, the, 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 a deep shift in what education is um, takes place from the idea that, uh, that, that there's real value in skilled, critically reflective citizens uh, to the idea that value simply lies in, in, in strategies for getting return on, your in, on the money you've invested. Um, and, and, and that to me is, a, is, is an absolutely uh, foundational shift in uh, thinking about education. Um, and it gets played out in a, in a whole lot of tiny little things. Um, and when we start grouping them together, you'll start noticing a bit of a pattern developing here. Okay, so what we start doing is we start moving, for instance, from the idea that, that, that um, you know, universities as, as kind of collaborating um, uh, networks of, of knowledge production move from, from the idea of producing scientific advancements for the good of society and for the good of the, of, 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 of the entire human race to um, creating technical advancements, uh, firstly to produce uh, third stream income for the university, to patent new, new designs, new discoveries, and secondly, for academics to, um, to, to do scientific and research work in order to, to produce uh, publications, recognize publications that, that, that they can then put on their CVs and use to advance their careers. Okay? This is a, also a very deep and very fundamental shift in what the university is even for. The other thing that we can start uh, seeing is that it involves a... A, a, a change from the university as first and foremost about the kind of free exchange of ideas to the university as being about branding and ranking. Uh, the university about being a particular idea, namely the idea of itself, which I'll talk about later. Um, and this produces another uh, important effect, which is a shift from the university as existing for society to the university existing for itself and existing for itself in order to promote itself. That, 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 that the, the business of managing the university is about the business of managing the reputation. And in, and, and in, and in, and in the world, in that world, reputation often means the international rankings of the university. So that starts becoming uh, a thing people think about and start trying to tweak the, the everyday structure of the university to be about rankings and ratings and not about the public good. <laughs> Um, and what happens at the same time that is essential to that process is that the university has unique spaces of collaborative decision making, of having faculty boards, senates, things like that. The, 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 those start shifting away and we start having um, universities run by managerial elites. We start having executive committees, executive deans, executive vice chancellors um, who start uh, forming kind of closed-door committees that start being the centers of power in the university. So a fundamental shift in the nature of governance takes place. Um, and, uh, and almost always without any uh, debate and consent from, from people involved. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Does it sound familiar? Yes. This, this horror story that I'm telling you. Okay, now what interests me, because one of my other hats I have is, uh, as a psychologist, is a relation between changes in systems and changes in personalities, and the way these kind of things weave in and out of each other, that personalities change systems and sh systems change personalities. It's kind of a, a good fit that certain societies allow certain kinds of people to exist, certain kinds of people create certain societies. 
already since Donald Trump won the election, a lot of people have felt emboldened to go on the street and start assaulting people of other sexual orientations, other races, other genders, um, because, because a particular kind of leader is creating a particular kind of social ethos which gives people permission to be certain kinds of people in their everyday lives. So it's now okay to shout insults out your car window at people with the darker skin if you're living in Texas. Um, and, and this really interests me because um, I think we haven't thought this through at the level of u uh, universities as kind of exemplary institutions. Um, and the way in which certain kinds of leaders shape universities in certain ways, but in the way in which certain kinds of universities produce certain kinds of human beings. Um, and, and this is the thing that troubles me. Um, so, in the global context of the move from kind of social democracy to neoliberalism in politics, we have a move from what, you know, I've, I've taken as examples there, uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream to uh, Margaret Thatcher's There Is No Alternative, okay? And these are really important uh, exemplary kind of utterances because what they show is the move from a kind of ethical, visionary, transformative, future-looking way of thinking about society to a kind of a lockdown, highly technical, uh, stripped of ethics, purely pragmatic um, way of thinking that doesn't look at complex human factors, that simply looks at spreadsheets, numbers, viability studies, uh, and makes decisions on that. And, and there's a whole tradition of work we're going back to the Frankfurt School, for those who are interested in that kind of thing, on, 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 on the role of the emergence of technocratic rationality. Because what we're really seeing within this move is the emergence, the shift from, 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 from critical reflexivity to, techni to technocratic rationality in universities. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you a, a, a little side story about um, the crime of the century. Okay. In fact, probably the... No, it's not the crime of all time, because it pales in, in, uh, to, in, to, to insignificance compared to things like the crimes of colonialism. But the crime of the century so far is the, the stock market crash of 2008. Okay. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things that people who were sort of nosing around, social sciences were poking around in this problem, found out. Firstly, they'd already known that psychopaths are overrepresented in politics and business management. Um, that they, they tend to be quite rare in ordinary society. I mean, you know, like gym teachers and policemen and things like that are often psychopaths, but they're really highly represented in, um, in, in business management and politics. Um, and then around the time of the, the Wall Street crash, where, where people were kind of aghast, like how did a, a group of about 300 people literally tank the global economy. I mean, how did they it, 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 like wipe out the life savings of tens of millions of people, send millions of people into unemployment, <coughs> millions of people into homelessness, um, people are left aging without medical care. Um, I mean, the, the implications of the, the economic crash, we, we were relatively buffered from it in South Africa, but it was, it was truly a, a global level catastrophe. Um, and, 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 and so they went in there and they said, well, how come all these psychopaths went into stockbroking? And the interesting answer they got is that they were recruited. <laughs> um, you know, um, the big investment banks told their HR people to do the standard personality assessments on their applicants, and the ones who scored high in psychopathy, they should employ them, because they'll make better investors because they aren't hampered by ethical concerns. They are, that if they can push the profits up from 16 to 18 percent, it doesn't matter if 100,000 people need to die. So they can do that more easily. Okay? Um, and, and, and of course, that to, to, for, for, for the short-term interests of these institutions, that worked fantastically. Um, for the medium and long-term uh, interests of actual human beings living in the world, this was an epic disaster. Um, but it points to something really interesting. It points to the fact that institutions sort of develop interests, okay, and they, and, and, and they, and they start being this sort of merging of fit between the interests of the institution and the kind of personality um, that, that, institute, that works well in that institution, and vice versa, that those emergent psychopathic personalities start making the institution itself 
getting to, uh, to um, being dragged in the direction of more and more um, uh, antisocial behaviour. Um, and I think this is, I think there's an instructive lesson there because I think what we wouldn't like to see is for universities to start becoming like Wall Street, um, which is exactly what the neoliberalisation um, project would want them to do. Um, but what we see in the universities then is the managerialization of education. And I think my, many of us who have been around for a long enough time have really watched this unfold. Okay? Uh, and, it, and all of these things, what interests me, they start by being superficially reasonable. They start by, oh, that sounds like a good idea if you don't think about it too deeply. Okay? So the idea of the managerialization of universities starts with the idea, look, We've got to have people who know, who, who know how to run things in charge, okay? We've got to know, have people who know how to balance books and, 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 and uh, perform good financial oversight. We, we, we really need that. I mean, you know, the fact that you, you, you may be a brilliant engineer or classicist just doesn't mean you can balance the books on a four billion rand a year institution. So, so, so you step out of the way and let's bring in some young uh, high energy MBA and let them take over those responsibilities, okay? But of course what happens is once you, you start with this commitment to, 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 to this kind of technical government, governance, you end up fundamentally changing what the university is and, um, and sort of through the back door a whole set of, of, of kind of technical changes um, and, and what starts happening is that the, the fundamental goals and values and principles of university start being replaced more and more every day by a set of technical strategies of financial management. Uh, once again, these things are not consented to at any point because they're not up for debate at any point because they happen covertly. Um, and they don't necessarily happen covertly because of conspiracy. They happen covertly because they're kind of just part of a a, 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 a kind of a glacial movement of kind of ideology and social organization that is, that is shifting through society. Um, the other thing that starts happening at the same time is there's a, that as universities become kind of bigger and bigger and more cumbersome, there's a desire for uh, a sort of efficient executive decisions. You don't want to sit in meetings all day. So what happens is that the democratic decision-making fora start handing over power to subcommittees, executive um, managers, um, and, 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 and so key decision-making power starts, starts being absorbed up into these managerial positions and out of um, these kind of consensus-producing uh, networks. Um, and what starts happening as a result of that is not that we get more efficient decisions, but the very process by which we arrive at decisions fundamentally changes. Instead of them being based in, on the academic tradition of critical reasoning, different viewpoints being expressed, being debated, rationally analyzed to arrive at the, 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 the most useful one, instead of collegial respect for the impact of every decision on all members of the entire organization uh, and the core uh, founding principle of, of, of mutual respect, um, uh, we, we instead have simply the, 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 the rationality on spreadsheets of these, of these hyper-managerial decisions. Um, so, at the same time, the other manifestation that I talked about before, this neoliberalization agenda, is the shift towards branding and ranking. That universities start thinking about themselves as brands and talking about themselves as brands and setting up uh, public relations units with staff who are responsible for uh, promotional media for the university. Um, and so uh, what, 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 what starts happening is that, that um, a, in, in, in order to, to manage the, the brand identity of the university, a, a set of criteria start getting imposed on the everyday practices of the universities. Okay? Um, and a set of measurements start being imposed. And these are the, 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 the measurements that are being used by, in, in this sort of abstract checklist to, to rank universities in the world and to say, oh yes, this year we, we were number 500 out of 18,000 institutions. Africa now has three in the top 100. 
and, and, and these, these become things that the university managers start defining their own success or failure on in terms of, 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 of fitting in with these abstract systems of um, evaluation. What starts happening then as a result of that is a, is, a, is a very, very deep and fundamental change. Is the university as a, as, as a network of rationality and collegiality, which is defined in terms of the, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the moments of everyday practice, the moments you sit discussing a decision with a colleague, the moment you sit talking to a student about the extracurricular problems that are impacting on these studies that the university can't provide assistance, with, but you can at least talk them through and refer them. All of those, those kinds of human moments um, start slipping away and start being replaced by checklisting. Okay? And the checklisting starts doing very specific things. So the checklisting starts putting uh, measurable pass rates and throughput goals um, as, as a substitute for measuring the kind of the emotional and intellectual development of actual human beings passing through the university. Um, and uh, student numbers start replacing the, the question of the, 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 the individual quality of attention and support that allows people to transform and, 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 and become members of society. Um, one of the key things that starts taking over at this place is, is the idea of publications and the ranking of publications. <laughs> Um, and so rather than the, 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 the knowledge production for the public good, we start seeing uh, uh, um, publication production for the purposes of ranking. And one of the things that starts happening in, in, in this mix is that instead of seeing themselves as part of a social community, both an intellectual community and, 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 and the social community of the broader society, people start seeing themselves as being very particular career paths. And they don't start seeing themselves as on particular career paths, they start seeing themselves as particular career paths. They start defining their self-worth and their identity and whether they're sleeping well at night in terms of whether this particular journal has accepted that particular publication which is going to lead to that research funding which is going to lead to this promotion in two years' time. Okay, and there's a fundamental kind of processes of alienation and dehumanization. And that once again, to the, the point I make it with all of these, that no one really consented to. Um, within this, we talk about the way in which pub the public image of the, of the university replaces the social value of the university. Um, and once you, once you allow that to happen, it also one of the interesting things that, that, that starts going on is that image management starts replacing other kinds of critical discourses. And in fact, one of the institutions that I had, one of the direct consequences of this, is that um, a, a whole new offense came into being that was used to dismiss quite a few people, which was bringing the university into disrepute, okay? Because suddenly, critical engagement saying, yes, but if you do that, it will have these negative consequences, doesn't become a helpful way of rationally achieving a more positive goal, it becomes a, 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 a it, it becomes uttering a, 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 a negative version of the current state of the university, which is, is, is punishable in the most severe terms. Um, and so the brand message of the university then replaces freedom of communication as, as, as the core for all academic practices. Um, the other thing that happens is the kind of commercialization of education, that students stop being future citizens who we are responsible to society for, and they start becoming customers. They start being people who are paying for a service, and just like Telcom sends you a text message saying, can you please rate on a scale of one to seven the quality of your service with our last customer care representative, that, that, that students start being assessed in the same way. Um, and so the idea of, of um, what the university should be doing starts, fun starts becoming a function of what students think it should be doing. Um, which, which at first seems, well that's probably a good idea, the, stu the, the students should evaluate the services that are being provided for them. But it's not a good idea in another sense, because the whole point of the education is to show students things they don't know. The whole point of a liberal education is to say to is to, uh, to, to, to get a student to, at the age of 18 thinks the most important thing in their life is when they buy their first 7 Series BMW, that that is in fact not so. And that in fact won't make them happy. 
and, and, and that in fact making their first million by the time they're 27 may not be the ultimate social good that they can achieve in their lives. Um, but that, that's, get, that gets stripped away because you can't interrogate the desires of customers. Those are just a given. You, all you do is you meet the desires of customers. And so, so um, the, 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 the whole knowledge basis and ethical basis of the educational project gets struck, stripped away and becomes subordinated to a, a kind of consumer culture, utilitarian view of education, which once again plugs back into the fact that the education is not for the public interest, it's for career advancement. And so everything becomes accountable to that. Um, <coughs> In terms of the slipping away of uh, kind of uh, open democratic debate and accountability is the emergence of covert operations, okay. Um, and here, okay, um, what we see is this thing that I've been pointing out again and again, that these changes don't happen because someone comes, from the, it comes into the forum and says, listen, we've been doing it this way, let's do it this way, let's debate about the, the, the pros and cons. It, it becomes part of the sort of Margaret Thatcher right, there is no alternative. We simply have to do things. We simply don't have the funding to do things that way anymore. The reality is simply now that we're expected to double our student numbers. The reality is simply that we cannot have these, the, the staffing. The reality is simply that unless we, we, we increase our journal outputs, we will not be internationally respected. We will not draw emerging scholars from other countries. It, it's, it's all in the, it's simply. It's all in the givenness of this. It's all in that this just has to be done because that's the world we already live in. All we are doing is adapting or dying. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of rationality um, that, 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 that we are working with. And that's the kind of covert operation that I'm talking about. Um, so all of these things just start happening and just seem superficially rational at the time. And then all kinds of other bad stuff starts happening and no one quite knows why it happened and when it started and what to do about it because it's no longer possible to actually have any input on deciding whether it was a good idea. But what interests me is to go back to my other point, is that once these, these adjustments are in place, they start changing the role of the university in society, they start changing the value systems of, of the educational system, but they start <coughs> changing the identities and relationships of the individuals within those systems. And this is what interests me, this, this good fit, like the good fit between, between uh, deregulated international banking and psychopathic personalities of the 2008 crash. Those, those kind of good fits are what interest me. Um, so, this is where um, we have to start looking at the kind of nitty-gritty of how it happens. And one of the ways in which it happens, which um, you can all look forward to in the very near future, is the introduction of performance management. Um, and performance management also, once again, starts with a superficial rationality, which is to say, we need to check that people are actually get, getting out of bed and doing their jobs. And we need to get the dead work out of the system and reward the people that are actually bothering to do their work. Okay. But what it instead ends up doing is it starts completely changing the definition of the jobs and the nature of the people who are, who are occupying those positions. And this once again works by the system of taking the kind of complex interactions that make up the job. That if you're a lecturer, um, that um, your, 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 your kind of teaching and learning practice is, 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 is made of so many complex moments, so many of those conversations outside the lecture, so many of those um, the, 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 those interactions with colleagues, um, so, so, so much of your community work feeding back into your research work, feeding back into your teaching, feeding back into the kind of skills you want your students to have, your personal ethics affecting what you believe is important content, all of those kinds of things. Um, those can't be measured in performance management. What, what performance management can do is give you a banal set of performance checklists. Okay, um, And so people start every six months checking off those lists, which is, you know, how many of your students passed this course, how many hours did you spend on that, what are your research outputs, how much funding did you raise this year. Um, and the interesting thing is that people start by just uh, doing those in a dismissive kind of way, it's like, oh my god, performance management, I've got to waste four hours this afternoon going click, 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 click. But an interesting thing starts happening at this point.
um, is that people start thinking about themselves in terms of those assessments. They start, they, 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 and it starts by thinking in terms of like their future. They start by saying, okay, well, I, I better do that otherwise I'm not going to be promoted in three years' time. And I haven't, I'm still on probation, so I better make sure I do this. And it starts by being a kind of a tactical thing, like a, I better just strategically do that to make sure this doesn't go bad. And then it becomes a kind of internalized thing. And then it becomes like, oh, that's what I do. So instead of getting out of bed and saying, oh, you know, I really love teaching this course, do people get out of bed and say, I better make sure I have an 85% pass rate and have a journal article out before the end of the semester. And, 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 and who they are, the kind of, the, the daily self-accounts they feed back to themselves start being fundamentally changed. And they actually end up being a different kind of human. Okay. Um, I mean, for those of you who want to go in a massive detail, just the, the theory note. Just take this idea and go and reread Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Okay. It's all there. Um, or Nicholas Rose's update of it with respect to organizational psychology. Um, and, and so this really interests me, is how these things like, oh, let's make sure people are doing their jobs, ends up actually changing the very definition of people's identities and sense of self when they, when they get out of bed in the morning. Okay. Um, an interesting thing that happens in this is things like time change. Okay. Time becomes a limited resource that you can't waste. You can't, you can't spend an hour and a half talking to a student who's, who's really struggling with something because that's not going to fit in on the checklist, okay? What's going to fit in on the, on the checklist is, 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 is the overall pass rate for the class. So you have to gear your time towards that, not towards these wasteful immeasurables, okay? Um, and, 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 and so your, 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 your sense of, of, of the everyday activities that make up your, your day start getting restructured. Um, and so, the, so these questions that get internalized, that you, that you start looking at every task in terms of the throughputs and the outputs and the measurable goals that are being achieved by those tasks. And when you can't answer those questions, you start being anxious about actually doing those things. But I'm wasting my time. I should be writing a journal article. Um, and, and, and this is, once again, a, total, a, a redefinition of lived academic life uh, that starts taking place. Another interesting thing that starts happening is um, that the people who are in positions of responsibility, the program leaders, the deans, the heads of school, um, suddenly start being, start being changed as well. And instead of being senior colleagues who have a, a, a extra responsibility of making sure that there are positive nurturing relationships, making sure the system is making everyone happy, start themselves evaluating and interacting with everyone else in terms of their checklists. So rather than being concerned about your personal development, suddenly your head of department uh, starts, starts getting really, really anxious that you aren't meeting the departmental performance goals. And because you aren't meeting the departmental performance goals, suddenly they start feeling let down by you, and they start being angry with you, and they start having to threaten and punish you to try and motivate you to achieve those things. So in fact, what work collegial relationships start, start becoming adversarial relationships, and what were decent human beings start becoming bullies. Okay. Um, and, I mean, in a, in a way, you know, just, just pausing with that. When I look back on, on, on 25 years of sort of academic and intellectual life, that actually all of my work, all of my research, all of my teaching comes really down to one simple question. And the whole point of this paper comes down to one simple question. question. Not question, just true, subjective thing about me as a guy. I just goddamn hate bullies. Like, really hate them. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm really talking about is the kind of bullification of, of what to me, when I was a, was a young person, was the possibility that there existed in society safe spaces. That's, that's really what I'm mourning in this analysis here today. Which brings us to the zombie apocalypse. 
<laughs> because as these processes unfold, the human community of democratic learning is replaced by a medieval hierarchy of vampire zombies and humans, an elite of soulless vampire overlords lives in the blood of Sarfdarfan students, or that the senior academics representing those in the organization and the public interest get replaced by business management, applying screws to extract every last drop of blood to write the glossy annual reports which serve only to advance their own egos and careers. At the same time, legions of middle management zombies, often failed academics seeking career advancement by other means, uh, become the predatory undead, roaming the building, searching for the brains to feed on. The humans around them simply become food for them to feed into the technocratic machine that once pastrates throughputs, outputs, and performance targets. In the context of this onslaught, humans increasingly retreat, cities of learning become wastelands, small groups retreat into fortified spaces, throwing scraps at the zombies in a de desperate attempt to keep them from breaking down the doors. And then the food runs out. Thanks.